I'm Jeff Fritz with Soundstage.com, and I'm joined today by Herman Gear, managing partner from SPL Electronics in Germany. Herman, how are you today? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Jeff. Nice to be here. So, Herman, the reason for the interview today, I don't think many of the Soundstage readers are familiar with SPL Electronics, and we have a pair of your beautifully made M1000 monoblocks in for review with Soundstage Ultra reviewer Aaron Garrett. And so we wanted to learn a little bit more about the company and your role there. So Herman, take it away. All right. Um, well, SPL is uh, yeah, it's, we are a pro audio company. And my partner Wolf started uh, the company already in 1983. And at that time, he was mainly... Uh, doing special design developments for like the Deutsche Bundestag, for example, they had like all of their microphones noise gated with uh, the electronics that he developed. But he was also a recording engineer and he had one of the earliest 24 track recording studios here in the in the area. And obviously, uh, looking back at the time when when the US dollar exchange rate was like one to 3.5 compared to the D mark at the time. Um, uh, equipment, audio equipment um, coming from the States um, was always extremely expensive. Um, so he was, uh, as being the radio and uh, a TV technician, he started to build his own equipment. And that's where, his, um, where he learned to uh, work around or to create products without really looking at them because he couldn't afford to pay them. So he was just like doing it all out of his mind, so to speak, I had. And um, in 85, I got to know him. I was I was then still at university studying, and uh, but uh, I was a bass, uh, I still am a bass player. And at the time, I ne definitely needed a new bass preamp. And, uh, uh, and, and I got to know Wolf, and, and then I started to, uh, he m um, changed uh, um, a product that he had at the time, which was like a little equalizer, three band, fully parametric, and he added um, a bass preamp to that. And that's how I, I got to know him. And um, soon later in 86, we started to work together. And uh, yeah, uh, in 88, we had one of our most um, influential developments uh, with the company, which later was called the uh, Vitalizer. And uh, the Vitalizer was a product, it's an equalizer, but an equalizer with, um, well, we, this would take a long way. It's, it is patented in, in the US, in China, in Japan, in Europe. So it's one of those few filters that ever received a patent. Um, and uh, it put us on the map in the pro audio world. So soon in, through the 90s, pretty much all commercials were uh, done uh, with a sound improvement use that box. We're still selling it mostly as hardware, uh, as software, sorry, as a plugin. And uh, it's one of those boxes where people use it and they don't want to talk about it, using it. So uh, yeah. It took us through the 90s and, and the 2000s with uh, being pro audio guys trying to push the boundaries there, getting more and more into um, uh, real super high end audio with the mastering people. And um, they required um, an increasingly better getting performance with analog audio. That was a, a, a challenge because if you remember through the 90s when the converters went, went from 16 to 18 to 20 to 24 bit and the sample rates were going up from single sample rate, dual sample rate, quad sample rate was already at the horizon at the time. They were just saying, hey, I, we, we cannot uh, listen to uh, each month to a new converter and uh, we need something on in the analog domain that is um, superior to what we see in the digital domain so that we can work from there and monitor and record and monitor everything in the analog world um, and being free from what is the flavor of the month in terms of what converter you have. These guys in mastering, they really, it takes them half a year to finally put a product to, um, to a production with a, with a client. That's how long they actually 
it takes them and not all of them but many of them to get used to to uh, uh, to the equipment so um, we now many years later uh, we've been developing a product that is called uh, the Phonitor which is a headphone monitoring amplifier it was one of the designs I made for the company uh, in terms of making it possible to be able to mix on headphones. That was the challenge. And, um, well, that's a whole story in itself, but I don't want to go there now. Um, this product went into, or was bought by, well, 50% of the production was bought by hi-fi enthusiasts because they were just thinking, hey, now I can finally listen to a mix like it's meant to be like being played back on speakers. I can listen, I can get that experience on headphones. So that was missing. And we were like surprised that there was this audience for this. Um, and it, it it went along luckily with the ongoing development of high-end headphones. So they were like, in the before that, headphones were like, something yeah you you listen to it when you want to have a focus on certain things but it's not like to enjoy music it was a something that served a need but it wasn't a, something where you can derive listening pleasure from that changed totally with the new with the uh, developments that that uh, the companies did in terms of the headphones and so there the customers were looking for headphone amplifiers that can that made a similar development and we were part of that uh, still are part of that uh, uh, stream and um yeah we then decided in 2014 15 that we want to do if there is that big of a market and they all enjoy our technology and 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 what we did, enjoyed the looks of that so why not start working on uh, on, a, on a product line um, for the hi-fi world and i kept it in the looks of the Phonitor 2 which was the professional version at the time because that was known to many hi-fi uh, um, enthusiasts uh, already so i said well I don't want to make a standard size hi-fi component because that's like everybody else is doing it and we already have um, a face or a look with the VU meters and the, and the toggle switches and, and the way it's been uh, designed. So I kept that. And um, we started then, uh, we started doing preamplifiers with DAX and uh, phono preamp stages and uh, um, and then we also started to build our first um, power amplifier nothing really spectacular in terms of technology that we use inside it's, and the same the m1000 that you got it's bipolar transistor class ab uh, so all the usual you would you might you would think the difference the difference is is the 120 volt rail, the Voltaire technology that we developed for the um, in the already starting in the 90s for the mastering people. So that's that's the way how it how we got our yeah how we moved into hi-fi as a pro audio company. Okay, so tell us about tell us about you know you guys have a wide range of products and if you peruse the SPL website, you can see the breadth of your product offerings for both home and for studio use. Tell us a little bit about one of your favorite SPL products. Focus in on something that our readers and viewers uh, might find super interesting from SPL. Um, oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> it really is a difficult. It's like if you choose which child you love the best. <laughs> it's hard to say, really. Um, uh, well, is it just one I should mention, or can I mention two? Or you can mention two. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Well, definitely, uh, Vitalizer, as I mentioned before, that's that's the one thing uh, as a product that was a development. Um, the beauty I love about that is that it was just pure luck during developing. There was no way we were ever thinking about achieving something like that. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to make this and here's the plan how to get there. It was just totally the opposite. It was 
experimentation uh, for two weeks uh, constantly during night sessions with music and playing with filters and just hoping to find that to find something where um, the whole filter setup that we have and it was super complex where that started to behave differently and this was all triggered by some some filter guy named Don Lancaster he was like he's he writes filter design books. Um, and at the time, Wolf told me, hey, I just read this book. And at the last page, he's saying, hey, there are like 2 million filters possible. And maybe just 2,000 have ever been built. And there are only like less than 10 that are in use. Now, forget what you read in this book. Start to look for it. I mean, there is enough out there to explore. That was kind of our ment mantra at the time. And we just started to... Uh, to look out and to play and to and 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 to hope, to f play and hope and figure out. And then we had this moment, and honestly, I know exactly when it was. It was February 18, uh, 1988, at about two o'clock at night, <laughs> when we heard this thing, this this sound coming out of this filter that was absolutely nothing like we've ever heard before. And we listened to a lot of things. Yes, and it uh, it was too complicated for us to actually put into into a product, but at that time we've been we we got a um, a lawsuit being coming up to us from a company called AKG, and they were like working for Afex, an American company from California, and they were doing an exciter, oral exciter. They had a patent on this years before, but they just got it. In, in Germany, and uh, and they were saying we're infringing that patent, which we weren't. But it it was like, what what could we do if they draw us to court? We our little small two people company was just down, was at the wall, and we said, okay, we can't make this one product which we already made the front panels for, but this new product that we have here, let's put that into that housing. So we got tremendous restrictions of cutting all of the control parameters like by a factor of four and trying to make this like work with just a little few knobs. And that was one of the the real keys where people then had like a few knobs on a unit and it just get better all the time you twiddled on it. This was the product which made SPL SPL. And that's why it's still my super beloved uh, product. And I, and, and I make a promise here and we're working on this, I will. I want to do this in the 120 volt Voltaire technology one day and bring it to Hi-Fi. It's a challenge and it's definitely something that Hi-Fi hasn't seen because our, where we put our company's um, reputation at, maybe at Jeopardy, not sure, because it's not used to do, to fiddle with sound but it is what it is. It's a personal sound designer and, it, and uh, we want to get to the point where our reputation in hi-fi is stable enough to put something like this out to the market. Well, so that, that sounds pretty about. awesome. That's, that's, that's a great story, Herman. Um, you know, it, 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 I think it's what's amazing to me is just the sheer history that is available at SPL. And, you know, when you tell me that your favorite product uh, was designed back in, I think you said 1998. Uh, that's quite a quite a long history in electronic design, and uh, you know that's actually it's quite surprising, uh, and it just shows you as well, you know the 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 number of and the breadth of product offerings that, uh, especially a lot of our North American readers uh, don't really get to 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 know about. And so that's one of the uh, other reasons that I was super glad that we were able to set up uh, some review products uh, from SPL. Well, the next question that I have for you is, uh, and you know, you, you just actually mentioned a listening experience from back in the late 90s, but can you tell us about another listening experience that you've had recently, perhaps with SPL products that stands out to you as something special? Um... Let me let me see. Oh, um, hold on, just a second. <laughs> sure. Talking about um, with SPL technologies involved, I just got 
um, this record. I don't know if you recognize it. It's uh, Peter Gabriel, uh, Life 1993 in, um, I think this was recorded in Modena in Italy. But I was, I remember being at that, uh, um, on that tour uh, in 1993 in Germany on a concert, uh, at Peter Gabriel's concert. And um, uh, yeah, fascinating all the way. I, I, I love this guy. So when I heard that uh, uh, Matt Colton, He's the mastering engineer in London at Metropolis and at Alchemy Mastering. That he cut this to vinyl. I called Matt and said, "Hey Matt, did you really work on this?" He said, "Yeah, yeah, that was a great thing." I said, "Man, do you think? Uh, yeah, um, I, I need to get a code of a copy of that." Hey, don't bother, don't bother. I sent you one, and uh, and he sent this over 180 grams and. Um, beautifully cut on our uh, uh, mastering console there in, in this place. And yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. And another thing that I uh, have it just here, it's that is, um, it's the Beatles Mono Masters. I was always, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, yes, Beatles put me on, I was nine when I bought my first cassette with Beatles. And it said Beatles Forever on that cassette, and I thought it was a different band. It wasn't the Beatles. It was like Beatles Forever. It was a different name and a different band. And I couldn't get it. I was nine years old. But I, this brought me to Beatles at the time. And uh, in the when I get all of the CDs that I bought later, um, I, I was disappointed by the fact that you heard this AB stereo, like vocals fully left and the guitar and the drums on the right and the bass left and some, you know, this was, this was not what it's supposed to be. This is what not it's meant to be. And in 2009, 10, I got to know Jeff Emmerich. Jeff Emmerich is the guy who recorded the Beatles at Abbey Road with uh, George Martin since 65 till the end. And he worked there since 1862 as an assistant and from 65 with Rubber Soul, he, he was the guy in charge at the desk. So I got to know him, very, very nice gentleman, very humble. And uh, he passed away in 2018, so just like uh, in October, I guess it was. Um, and he wrote a book, you should read this book, it's here, there and everywhere. It's about how he changed music and music recording at Abbey Road during the Beatles times. So if you're a bit of a gear geek and you want to know how this actually worked out, then this is the book. Um, and uh, and I and I mean, we spoke about Beatles and 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 he said to me, you know, I mean, I don't under, I don't get it. And why do they make AB stereo out of it? It's just we made mono mixes, and it was to be designed to be perfect as mono. And then it was all, it all had to be stereo on the releases on CD and stuff. And then you, they just took the channels apart and threw them. And now you hear them from all around, from left and right, but they are not glued together like they should be, where we put all our effort in. So when this came out, I had to buy it. Those were the original Mono Masters from tape cut to vinyl. Well, Herman, that's fascinating. And I really appreciate uh, your listening experiences. I appreciate you uh, telling us about SPL, and I feel like I have a much better handle on the company, and uh, gosh, it really makes me curious to hear some SPL products in my own system. And uh, But thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join uh, Soundstage today, and uh, for those of you that are watching that are also curious about SPL in the next uh, couple months, be sure to tune in to SoundstageUltra.com. Uh, for some SPL product reviews. And uh, Herman, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. Thank you very much.